Welcome to Café Rollist. I got an haircut, finally. F uh, I'm done with my mullet. And today I'm joined by Pam. Pam, could you introduce yourself to the viewers of Café Rollist? I'm Pam Ponsalan, also oh. known as Pamu. You can find me on The Dog Sailor. Sorry, could you repeat uh, because I I uh, I did a there's always technical issues. I did something wrong with your microphone, so please okay. start over. <laughs> no problem. Um, hi, I'm Pam Ponsalan, also known as Pamu. You can find me on Twitter under the Dovetailer. You can also find my itch and Patreon under the same uh, handle. So that's the Dovetailer. One word. I am a queer game designer, editor, consultant, and I guess a community point person under RPGC. And I've been game. I've been designing games since maybe last year. But I do a lot of hobby stuff, uh, including writing. I think most of it is because I used to be a teacher back in the day. So I kind of like sharing knowledge and connecting with people. I'm currently busy with maybe two, three games. Uh, one of the big ones that people are excited about uh, would be the, the Dagger Isle supplement. Nothing official yet, but it's caught a lot of attention. I'm super excited about that. So that's for Blades in the Dark under John Harper. And I'm also trying to do a Filipino fantasy gothic game called 7,107 Iscariots. So that's a bit of a homage to my Devil May Cry background. Uh, I've got a lot of other projects, but uh, those are the ones that are kind of occupying my brain space right now. So but it's that, nice to meet all of you. Yeah, that's only already quite a bit. I mean, it's. Uh, I remember we we met each other through the, the game design launch by Jason Pitre, I believe. Yes, that's correct. And then you introduced me to. You were recommended I get in touch with a couple people who got featured uh, on the show. So it's uh, it's only normal that uh, it's your turn. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that worked out. So uh, we started this show as a result of the lockdown. Uh, what uh, and one of the we got a few traditional questions. What is your routine like at the moment? Is it are you still under? Uh, the sort of lockdown-ish that we have in the UK, because it's it's not quite a lockdown, to be fair. Um. <laughs> well, I um, because of the quarantine, my day job kind of got shafted, so I'm mostly focused on commissions. A lot of these commissions are a result of a single convention called Big Bad. I think it's uh, the people from the states would be very familiar with it. It takes place in San Francisco every year. Uh, or the San Francisco area, rather, every year. Uh, that was my first international game design convention. So things just kind of worked for me. And m me being out of my day job means that my usual routine is wake up, do errands, and then work on commissions. If there are no commissions to work on, then try to figure out one of my own projects. And if that doesn't work, then read more games. So that's generally what we've been up to. Uh, quarantine in Manila is pretty serious business. So most of us are really hold up at home. So yeah. So wait a second, because my geography is terrible. So when you said you are in the same time zone as me, uh, I told, oh, so actually you're, you're in London. So no, you are, you are abroad in Manila. Yeah, I, we, <laughs> Manila, ju so we, we just happen to be somewhat vertically in the same uh, <laughs> branch. <laughs> I guess so. Um, so yeah, it's it's 9 p.m. here because uh, Southeast Asian area. So I can kind of swing um, European time zones depending on the the hour. It's like this is a good hour for me because it's it's late but not that late so i'm still very awake <laughs> okay so, so we are not in the same time zone you are plus yeah, seven <laughs> okay i'm yeah. so confused uh at, <laughs> at the moment so the commission you do are uh for people not aware of your work the there are drawings there are writing what, what sort of commissions are there have you worked on oh, anything interesting recently Oh, well, most of it is, is really game design. So I write and world build uh, for, for other games. Um, I think the most interesting work, or rather the most public work that I have out there is under Spire, which is Grant Howitt's work. Uh, I wrote one mission for Shadow Operations, but the very first international commission that I ever got was for a Kickstarter called uh, Curse of the House of Rookwood. I think it was under Nerdy Pub Games, and I wrote a Filipino family scenario under their system. 
but most of my commissions again are world building and game design i think the second tier in terms of the kinds of commissions i get would be editing for games so if people need let's say somebody to pass over for their grammar or if somebody wants me to help them develop their game uh, that's the kind of editing work that i do the biggest one I can highlight there is a Filipino mech game called Maharlika. Uh, it is under a creator named Joaquin. Um, he's very, very talented, but he kind of needed somebody to edit the entire book for him because he originally wrote about 200 pages in Filipino, and then he translated it to English. So he kind of needed somebody to brush it up, and that was my first major editing gig. Then I also do sensitivity consultant. Uh, I, I also work as a sensitivity consultant. My first big project there was Arcanist Press. I think it was the D&D Ancestry and Culture, or the D&D Ancestry and Lineage uh, um, zine. And I think I was one of maybe three consultants there. So I kind of do a bit of everything. The areas that I really don't know anything about would be uh, art, I, I can't draw to save my life, um, and I can't do graphic design very well, but I am trying to learn my way around layout, so I think that would wrap up my work more or less. Yeah, I need to get serious about, uh, I've been so bad at getting into the next phase of developing my own game. I need to write more, I need to edit it, <laughs> I, need, I need to hire a game designer, uh, it's, uh, it, it's tough to... F work out where you should stop and have somebody else support you with their own skill and their own perspective on, on what you're doing. Yeah, uh, that, that was something that I'm only beginning to learn now because most of my game design, I know that some people would feel that it does not count, but I think that a lot of game designers really start because they fell in love with another game and then they started homebrewing. So a lot of D&D players and GMs got together, they made their own thing, and then they realized, okay, I'm not satisfied just making for another game. I want to do my own stuff. In my case, it was World of Darkness. So I used to homebrew that game like crazy, mostly because um, World of Darkness didn't really have a lot of Manila stuff out when I was GMing. So I kind of branched out from that. And uh, it's been an interesting journey learning how to balance um, like as you put it, where are my limits and where do I need help here? And then of course, uh, I want to make sure that I compensate people properly for their work. So that adds another layer of tension because uh, especially in the time of a global pandemic, I don't really have a lot of money to go around because we're all kind of living uh, paycheck to paycheck among us designers in Manila. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to think, okay, I need to make a game so that I can earn for this big project of mine that isn't getting done yet because that requires a consultant, an editor, and a layout artist. I, I think um, my Powered by the Apocalypse game is, is facing that issue right now because uh, Sundo was made, um, I think last year, it was my first major RPG, but it needs an editor and a layout artist. And it also needs somebody to check for sensitivity because it does deal with death and memories. And the last thing I want is to create a game that uh, has very real triggers that uh, I am not aware of because no designer is perfect. And even with the best intent, we, we could mess things up. So, and, and then the game also needs play testers. So there's a lot of like different factors uh, to, making, to making projects. And um, I, I don't know whether other designers really face this, but sometimes you have big ideas and they kind of run away from you and you know that you can't do it on your own. Uh, so you're kind of like, I need help because I, I have this great idea, but I, I don't know what it is. So yeah, it, it can be a lot. <laughs> it, it sort of becomes so much more real and encouraging as soon as you have play test and you get more people involved. I mean, as soon as I purchased some art, the, the thing became much more real for me, but for everybody else uh, at the same time. Although it's a bit confusing. It's, uh, I mean, the, the artist I purchased a couple pieces from uh, is super nice. His name is Bodhi. Uh, he's an Australian mm. based in the Netherlands. But now people tend to assume that uh, that's it. I hired him for the whole game. I would love to work uh, with him more and uh, hire him for the whole game. But the truth is, 
we don't have any material commitment towards that. It's just uh, I purchased some of his art to to illustrate uh, the the announcement. So no, not even the game, but uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, in the mind of people, it starts to gel immediately. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Um, I think I have the the artist that I've worked the most with is uh, an artist named Christina. She's she's based in Manila and she made Sundo come to life. So all of the pieces in the book are her work. And we have a co-publishing arrangement because itch does not allow uh, revenue sharing. So what I do is I just uh, I would think I get a hundred US dollars of earnings before I inform her, hey, uh, I can give you 30% of this cut because that was our agreement. Uh, and that will that will last until the project and even beyond the project being published because I personally have no intention of, of changing the art of the game. Uh, it's, it's very nice, I think. So, mm -hmm. And also I came up with this agreement and it's Scout's Honor because uh, without Christina, the game would not look as compelling uh, as, as uh, if, if I just published it or used, I guess, stock art. So um, I'm facing that wall of I really want to hire artists, but uh, I have no money. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah, it's expensive. Uh, what I'm trying to do right now is try to to purchase existing art. So it's, it's not stock uh, or free copyright Cont uh, art, it's art I still need to purchase, but at least if it's already drawn, if they are not committed, uh, there's no some exclusivity agreement with somebody else, uh, at least it, it's less expensive than commissioning a new piece of art to, to someone. So it's kind I think it's it's kind of a way around. And maybe maybe it could be a good inspiration also if someone likes, if people, uh, the game designer know an artist they really lo love the work of, uh, they can build a design based on their art. Uh, I guess it's what happened with Tales from the Loop when you think about it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So RPGC, what is it? Is it strictly about Manila and the Philippines? Is it broader or, or did it start and what is it about? Because um, my main show, The Race Podcast, it's all about RPG communities across borders and break the bubble of English speaking strictly the UK, the US, and even in that relationship, the US got this huge, huge weight. Uh, <laughs> so when I heard about the RPGC, I was like, oh yeah, that's that's so cool. I really want to hear about what is happening, the tabletop action which is taking place elsewhere in the world. Well, uh, RPGC as a hashtag, I think, has been around for the past maybe since 2017, if I put it kindly. Um, maybe out of the group of friends who started it, I'm very close to about two or three of them. And all of them are creators who really love game design. At the time that they made the hashtag, they weren't they, they had not released any formal products, but they were planning on publishing. So the hashtag was born out of a mutual desire to uplift each other and to kind of communicate uh, within our own region. Because uh, admittedly, a lot of creators from RPGC played D&D and then found out that they weren't really into the system so much. So they wanted to make their own stuff. And that kind of encouraged them to do game design. It is less a community. Like I like saying this whenever people ask me about it. It's less a community and more many different spaces that all kind of agree that the hashtag does not belong to any single person and that nobody is a leader in the community. We kind of just manage our own stuff and we help each other out. And we try to network as, as industry people first and as friends uh, last but that if that's just my opinion because uh, if you ask anyone else about rpgc they might say different things um but yeah that's how it started on our end um i tend to be one of the noisier people trying to push the hashtag but a lot of that is actually because of my osr leanings um i'm a very my, my design roots really started in terms of publishing games under the osr space called sword dream and Sword Dream has nine principles. One of them is basically breaking down gates, uplifting people, and connecting with different communities. That there is no such thing as a center, that a center should not exist, and that everybody should be empowered to do their own thing. And that was very inspiring for a lot of members of RPGC who, are, who feel frustrated, alienated, or uh, kind of 
picked, pushed out of, of spaces that are primarily, admittedly, American, I guess, or white. So uh, I'm, I can't really say that we have a lot of consolidated plans because, again, uh, nobody's really a leader. But we do have a Discord space that is very active. At least some of us who started the hashtag and we try to kind of talk to each other and say like, hey, you know, what's up? Do you want to do a game jam or what's happening on your country? Um, so that that's about the extent of our activity. Occasionally, you'll see game jams. Uh, you will see us being very loud about promoting each other. And equally, you'll see us uh, being very, very vocal about issues that affect us, either as people or as designers. So we, we tend to seem, we're usually very quiet and very friendly. Uh, but if something affects us, we kind of close ranks very quick and, and help each other out. So. Uh, I think that about sums up RPGC. I have been noticing that um, some people from beyond RPGC have been wondering, uh, can we do something similar for our spaces? Like, I think recently um, a friend and patron of mine asked me to make a tweet about uh, looking for Latin American designers. And uh, her reason for doing that was because I kind of want to see if Latin America has some sort of RPGC kind of feel, you know, to it. So that became a very interesting networking exercise. So there, there has been some talk from outside of, of the region about uh, similar movements. Um, I'm all for it as long as people are comfortable because uh, we really do need to recognize that uh, tabletop spaces are are varied and diverse. We're all coming from different walks of life, and everybody should recognize that. So the idea is to have, uh, I mean, to to encourage initiative in other places in the world. And you think it somewhat falls under the the RPGC umbrella, or is RPGC a bit more centered, maybe de facto around the the Philippine Sea, the Sulu Sea, uh, and and your your region of the world, or is it sea as in across the seven sea because it's still a bit unclear oh, it, for me oh it's it's sea across southeast asia okay so it's really like our our ah, space the, the, all right yeah. sea -E <laughs> yeah. southeast asia yeah. okay. <laughs> uh but the, the philippine artists are very very noisy we love social media so it's usually the philippine creators that are like woohoo rpgc it's all us right uh, so we tend to be a lot more active than many of our counterparts um, we have been fighting to expand a bit more uh, and try to find more uh, creators from indonesia from malaysia and also from thailand and vietnam uh, I haven't really been able to focus on, on doing community work and networking there, so it's been a bit uh, difficult on my end, but I always hope that when people ask me about it, somebody from those regions is listening and going like, hey, you know, I'd love to network, so that, that'd that be ideal. So yes, it's it's focused on um, Southeast Asia, but other people have been, like beyond the region, inspired to do their own thing. I, it's, it's great because I learned something today. I'm, uh, it's. It's convenient for my listeners because I'm I'm the the most idiot, uh, the least knowledgeable podcaster. But through my question, they can find out uh, about stuff themselves. Hopefully, or just just take their head into their hands and uh, and uh, be very sad about uh, how foolish I am. <laughs> so Southeast Asia, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, well you know I was C, I was uh, t uh, yeah seven C and this sort of, this sort of thing. I knew it was around the, this part, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I find it very interesting in uh, so I'm, I'm a bit more European centric in uh, in my contacts and uh, but I, I find it fascinating to see uh, a couple of things happening first of all I see more and more publishers uh, using crowdfunding to raise awareness about their own local games and have English translation happen and in parallel yes. I also see publishers like Chaosium uh, to a lesser extent, Modifius maybe uh, engage into distributing those games or developing with partners uh, supplements which are centered uh, in uh, Harlem, Berlin. Uh, there are projects for for ones in France. Uh, wh what is the your scene uh, in that aspect? Are there projects already things available? In English, uh, are they, are they going to be crowdfunded? Uh, are there Call of Cthulhu supplements uh, you would have heard of, which are centered around the Southeast Asia? 
Well, the the main challenge with Southeast Asian game design is most of us are stuck doing the publishing work independently through drive through and itch almost exclusively. Kickstarter is not supported in a lot of our countries, so oh. there's absolutely no way for us to, yeah, we, we can't do it on our own. Um, I did get some generous offers from people to kind of be my project sponsor for some of my games. Um, so far, I have declined, mostly because the the taxes are hellish, because essentially they will be handling the project and it will be reflected on their tax record. And that takes a lot of trust and accountability, and I would not wish that upon anybody. And then a lot of it is also my own energy levels, given that I'm very busy trying to make commissions. Uh, there are many projects actually that I cannot talk about yet. <laughs> so there, there's that, like I've, I've gone under NDA a lot, which is refreshing for me because I'm trying to break into the industry. So I, I wouldn't actually say that we have a physical publishing um, venue so far, that that's not really a thing here, mostly because you have to kind of publish it on your own. Uh, that said, because of the networking that some of us have been doing, uh, particularly me and a couple of friends, uh, we got very lucky to catch the attention of some international publishers. And they have been very generous in believing in us and giving us commissions. So in typical RPGC fashion, when we're hired, we tend to look for an opportunity to tell these publishers, hey, I have a friend, you might want to hire them for your next work. So many of us have ended up on Kickstarter projects uh, as stretch goals or even as co-developers. And some of us are also involved in anthologies. Uh, and I think more than a number of us have actually contributed to charity bundles or even charity projects that were published and distributed through platforms like Exalted Funeral. So that that's generally how we are. Um, I, I can't speak for the other countries in RPGC because I'm not very familiar with the way that their distributions work. But in the Philippines, there is no tabletop uh, group that publishes games, at least no reliable ones. So I do not foresee us having physical distributors for a very long time. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of it. I'm curious, the, the Kickstarter situation, is it related specifically to to Kickstarter the platform or are there local regulations? Because I know we had uh, Paco from GMS Magazine who just launched his crowdfunding for his Gibraltar-centric Call of Cthulhu, uh, well, Cthulhu Lovecraft-esque uh, game. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he's using Game on Tabletop, which is a French platform, which is available, which has been growing in Germany as well. I know they're they're trying to get uh, more of the crowdfunding uh, attention, and it's specific for tabletop. So, do you know if something like Game on or Game on or other platform are available in Philippines, or is it is it some local regulations which stops you from using them? Um, I'm unaware of the specifics of the law for it, but I do know from my five-year encounters in real estate that uh, I, our laws are probably a big issue. <laughs> I don't know how, I can't get into the intricacies of it, but I'm sure that that's a contributing factor because I think the only crowdsourcing platform that I know for any kind of purpose that uh, allows Filipinos to do some sort of crowdfunding would be GoFundMe. I don't even think Indiegogo is an option. And I know that no games distributor online uh, is willing to sponsor it. Like the only Southeast Asian um, projects that I know of off the top of my head, Lauren Song of The Bachelor was under ZXU. Uh, he is a Malaysian designer. And I think that Lauren Song was published through Exalted Funeral. I do not think it was crowdfunded. Then we have Sina Una up and coming. I'm part of that project. It's a, it's Philippine-inspired Dungeons & Dragons 5e setting. There's also Islands and Aswangs. That's also Filipino. Um, but I don't really know of a lot of uh, other settings. I've heard that there is a Call of Thulu setting uh, that will be in colonial Vietnam. But I've also heard that a lot of Vietnamese readers are not happy with it. So there, there's a lot of inherent tension there because um, one hot button topic that I've noticed for most designers under RPGC is we all come from countries that were former colonies of another country. So um, when designers get into those hairy lines of talking about the colonial periods of our country, 
um, not a lot of people get it right and we end up with a lot of voices that are not our own so and we ourselves have difficulty designing for that area it is technically a rife part of our history that does not have a lot of um, reliable historical records so mm. I, I can't re- yeah it, it's it's a lot there are a lot of things that people can talk about when it comes to designing for our, our I guess our culture or our settings yeah, I saw a Kickstarter actually run by, I believe, French designers, which centered around uh, Indochina. And uh, on one hand, I was very interested. And then looking into it, as far as I could tell, it only mentioned consultants, which were locals. Uh, locals as, uh, uh, I don't know the right word. Uh, I mean, the designers apparently have lived... I mean, it's it's typical of French designers. Uh, the the culture of uh, appropriation, sadly, uh, is, is even behind what you see in the US. Uh, so it's very common to see French designers saying, I spent my whole life in China, so here's my, na- my game set in China. And it's all right because I'm... Uh, I live all my life in China, and often, sometimes, there are even uh, academics who, who studied and taught in China, but they, they will only have one consultant rather than a co-designer who is yeah. Chinese or Vietnamese and so on. And it's, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sort of in between because as someone who engages a lot more, actually, with the English-speaking community than the French-speaking ones, uh, yeah, that's a field where on the continent they are mm-hmm. they are sort of, of of behind the train. So yeah, that when you when I see those kind of train, I'm like, uh, is that is that is that all right? I'd be curious to have a, a, a local <laughs> opinion on that. Um, having done a lot of sensitivity and consultancy work, um, most of it is grounded in my training under my master's degree, which is cultural, uh, literary and cultural studies. And one of the first lessons that we learn as cultural studies majors is that you are an anthropologist, which means that ultimately you are an outsider to a community looking in. Therefore, your perspective will always be different. You will be coming from a different set of ideologies and contexts. I've been made to understand, and this is something that I also believe now that I think about it, that the real job of a sensitivity consultant is somebody who must eventually make themselves obsolete. Um, An ideal world would be uh, a world of um, games that would not need people to consult on everything because we would have mutual respect for each other. Now, since that is not an ideal world that's going to happen anytime soon, um, the best thing, I think, is that designers need to recognize that certain stories are are not stories that they are entitled to. Uh, that's an extremely important thing to remember. I know that it sounds very harsh, but I, as a queer woman who is very clearly Filipino, um, my lived reality will always be a lot more difficult than somebody who is not from Manila and is not brown and is not queer. Uh, My stories are my stories and only my stories. So I will take offense and I will be harmed if said stories are portrayed by somebody who isn't even a little like me. The ideal that I would think is if you understand that, then you will also understand that if you must insist on writing it, you should either sponsor somebody who is in a better position to write it for you or you should bring them on as a co-designer, meaning their decisions are as important as yours. Or, and if you're going to do uh, a sensitivity consultancy thing, that consultant should be involved at every step, even before you conceptualize the project and begin designing. It's just easier than to, finishing to the, a design project to and the point having when, an editor. To the point <laughs> when it's, it's, it's pretty much a co-designer at this point, uh, I would say, so. Yeah. That, that's, that's right. So I, I feel very strongly about it, of course, because we are living in a world where we are seeing the damage of a lot of racism and oppression. Uh, and I think that while we'll never get rid of it, I really think that we're running out of excuses for ignoring the elephant in the room. And it, uh, it continues to 
well, it continues to either harm me and anger me that there are a lot of projects that do not have that sensitivity. Uh, there, there are a lot of ways that we could combat this issue. And I think that everybody has to do their part in it, whether it's uh, like even even this discussion, which is why I'm grateful that I'm being brought onto a stream. Uh, I'm being given visibility and I have a platform where I get to talk as myself. I'm not just the smiling Filipino in the room. I'm being interviewed. That is an important step. And uh, I guess we can all find a way if we really think hard enough. Uh, it's my pleasure for having you, and uh, I'm very thankful that you are you were available uh, for for this. It, it's very, I think it's you know, hearing your voice is very important because uh, I think it's amazing we hear more and more voices from minorities in the U.S., including the Asian mi minority. Uh, but uh, it's important to get a message from. Uh, uh, other uh, well in Philippines you you wouldn't be a minority but you're a minority I would I guess in uh, we could say in in the industry uh, worldwide because um, you know this question of the French designer who does uh, and I'm doing I'm not, I'm not saying that to to bang onto a specific individual but from my uh, experience as a European uh, someone who was brought up in Belgium who speak French. It's mm -hmm. and again, someone who engaged with the English-speaking community. It's quite uh, interesting. It's not the right word, but racism is very pervasive uh, in on the continent, even more so than than it is, I would say, uh, in the U.S. Uh, I mean, we we never quite had segregation and this sort of things, and. On one hand, uh, racism is less is less outlandish, but at the same time, it's it's more discreet. And while mm -hmm. you expect in the RPG community there are sad ex uh, exceptions to that, that uh, let's say lecture established designers in something which is an inte intellectual exercise uh, like even gaming are aware of those questions. What I find in Europe is that people who should you would expect to be aware of that are not because their point of view is <laughs> yeah but uh, we are in belgium we are in france or we are in germany we're not the us we're not racist like that and actually they're like actually you you <laughs> are you are maybe even more biased uh, than than people uh, abroad and th there are other questions which i find fascinating but we are which are very real that of uh, the theme of appropriation uh, th there are cultural, historical, uh, story with responsibilities which were not owned uh, by European nations, uh, socioeconomic factors which uh, make things are, are, are not super straightforward. And for instance, uh, a relationship which was a big part of um, me growing up is a relationship of French speakers with Japan. And Japan's mm. got it, its story. It's got his, um, for lack of better word, confidence culturally. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got his old con colonial past, uh, which is uh, something I'm, I'm not well placed to discuss. But uh, Japan engages in appropriation of European things and Europeans because they are confident and they are not in a socio-economic difficult situation. They are fine with that, and the Japanese, mm -hmm. to some extent, they are fine with. They're often flattered if a French designer does something related to Japan but then then it becomes an excuse and sometimes that happened with China also but then it becomes an excuse to do stuff which uh, hurt Asians abroad Asians in the US which don't have this uh, situation which is of uh, robust of confidence so so yeah it's complicated and at the same time I don't find it's helping. It's very important to have the voice of agents in the US. It's extremely important. But yeah, too, we, we don't hear enough from the voice of uh, people like you outside of the US to, to, to understand better that uh, it's not okay. It's not, it's not just uh, US agents who have issues with this and oh, this is because they're, they're Americans, which is the, the answer of a lot of European designers. It's 
And we need to understand the sensibilities uh, of things. Sorry, I went on for for a big ramble, but uh, it's fine. It, it really is a complicated issue, and I'm glad that you mentioned it because we we also have that strange tension in the Philippines, where I hear a lot from the privileged classes of the Philippines, and myself included, because the fact that I have streaming equipment and I'm free at 9.30, uh, 9.30 p.m. to do a stream and do game design means that I have money. I am not poor. Uh, I am solidly lower middle class. I have a great family network and anybody from my area upwards, all English speaking, all well educated, we tend to say exactly the same thing. We can't possibly be racist because we don't have American problems, which is absolutely not true. There is a very long history of Filipinos being terribly discriminatory and downright racist to black people. That is one terrible thing. We are also extremely racist to our own kind. We have indigenous groups here that we totally ignore and have segregated. So we like to say we have this very weird tension of saying we're oppressed abroad, but we also oppress other people of color and we oppress our own indigenous people. So um, another thing that a lot of people don't really like discussing, but it is a reality that we must face, identity is a tricky thing. An Asian American of any kind is very different from a pure Asian who was based in their original country. A Filipino American is different from a Filipino Canadian who is different from a Filipino in the Philippines. We all have different issues and different concerns. I could not possibly imagine what it's like to be in a predominantly white country as a Filipino girl. Uh, that would be very difficult. I've heard a lot of horror stories. And I've even experienced like the barest shade of it whenever I travel. Uh, this the simple question of, "Honey, why is your English so good?" is basically racism. Uh, they can't believe that I am a good English speaker. Uh, that's and that's what I face. I've had friends who have been chased down the street uh, from where they were. I did grow up in I did grow up in Vancouver uh, until I was about ten years old, and. It was only when I was in college here that my mother opened up about all of the racist stories that she faced. She was ignored during uh, parent-teacher conferences, and she even had parents coming up to her saying, we don't want our sons and daughters playing with your, with your daughter because she's brown. So the, those are different stories. Like I'd never faced that kind of racism here. Uh, but that's not to say that I don't have my own concerns. So. I think generally all designers, anyone who is looking into their, our industry should understand that their perspective is thoroughly their own. And that if anybody is even a shade different from you, whether it's in terms of your color of skin or your nationality or your gender, maybe listen to what they have to say because their reality has been completely informed in a totally different way from yours. Uh, so there, there's just so much that we should, as an industry should be talking about. Uh, I've been made to understand again that the industry has changed since, the, since it began around the 80s and 70s. It was predominantly white. Uh, I think Europe had some spheres of their own design. America also had their own design. And it, it's so different now. Um, anyone who wants to could set up an itch today, put out a game, and they're a game designer. And I sense a lot of people having strong feelings about that, but that's the reality of it. And everybody needs to start talking more and having these discussions. So moving forward, I know we, uh, I'm not trying to pull us away from uh, ne ne sort of somewhat negative topics, but sort of looking towards uh, the future. Uh, each time Asia is brought up and, and Asia is, uh, I mean, to some extent, Europe is also a, a stupid term because it brings together people which are <laughs> extremely different with these very <laughs> yeah. different stories, circumstances, and uh, often had uh, violent interactions with one another. Sometimes uh, they still do. But uh, each time it's brought up uh, in Europe, uh, what people think is, is the demographics, the, the huge market, uh, <laughs> the, the, the huge de development and so on. And... And me, as I was yesterday complaining about something with uh, a fellow tabletop RPG fans from, from the US, I was lamenting mm -hmm. about the, the, the demographics of the, the US and the Americans in the TRP, TTRPG space. And it was all about mostly D&D &D and, and their own perspective, just 
as a result of of their weight in numbers uh how do you see uh, is there is there a market which you could see developing uh, i know ttrpg is always uh, something tiny 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 compared to board games itself compared to video games itself compared to yeah. to movies and so on but uh, uh yeah there are there are movies industries entertainment industries going in china uh, which has been established for decades in often uh, japan uh, india uh are, is there is there hope that there could be a, a, this critical mass of players in southeast asia which which they, they become something really really noticeable when you get on twitter for instance and and when you look at the the releases of, of things on drive through do do you think there's there's growth you could hope for there in becoming a a market on your own rather than uh like like we all do which is try to design a game which will be successful in the US if if we have commercial uh ambitions of any sort well uh we already have a large market from D&D and then everybody just kind of moves on from it or stays i am hopeful though that tabletop as a hobby is growing a little more especially in the time i hate to say it at the time of pandemic where most people are at home and they end up just downloading a lot of games and playing them and finding ways to do it online but beyond the crisis that is happening right now i do foresee that well rather i've been noticing that a lot more filipino creations are being shown in wider platforms and the thing with the geek space at least in the philippines again i can't speak for other southeast asian countries but all geek spaces in the philippines are tied together so the moment somebody presents something in let's say netflix for animation and it is a 100% authentic filipino game other geeks tend to talk and wonder can we do this for ourselves so because um the philippine tabletop scene kind of exploded since last year many of us i notice are trying to find our voice and figure out how to present our country for ourselves Uh, there is an interesting game jam called Wika Jam. Uh, Wika meaning language in Filipino. And the pledge of the game jam was to get Filipino designers to write in their own language, which tackles an interesting problem for us because we have, I think, hundreds of languages and dialects in our tiny archipelago. Oh, and see. all of us... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. So um, people writing in their vernacular means that the games are automatically more accessible in their locations versus it being in English. So my hope at least is that somehow me and other people will be able to contribute to this boom. Even if it hits a small percentage compared to the rest, that would be great. I acknowledge that we will never be as big as an industry uh, as other countries and that admittedly I don't see in my lifetime Uh, our design orientation changing, meaning that I don't think that our design orientation will ever not be white facing. We will always end up in some form or fashion, at least for this lifetime, trying to get the notice of either Europe or America, because those are the, being blunt, those are the countries that pay us the best money. Uh, our freelancing industry here is terrible. Um, What I'm making right now for simple commissions are paying bills in ways that I could not have imagined if I had tried it here. And culturally, the Philippines, many Filipinos, inherently respect the word of a foreigner over their own people when it comes to creations. So it's kind of a weird feedback loop where you design for an American audience and then because the American audience acknowledges you, your own people acknowledge you. So that's a bit of a strange tension. So uh, I guess it's a long-winded way of saying we have a lot of work to do. I am hopeful and optimistic, but we have a lot. We have a long way to go. It's difficult uh, because, well, yesterday in, in that interaction with uh, that, uh, that uh, U.S. citizen, uh, the, the matter of language wa was brought up. And it, it was delicate because uh, I'm white, I'm privileged, but at the same time, any foreign language compared to English is in a weird position. Uh, not, not just the language, but any kind of entertainment industry, for instance, to give it a, a term which is already loaded and uh, an Americanism. Uh, and right. and what, when you tell that, it reminds me of uh, the French cinema, 
uh, especially popular cinemas. French cinema used to be its own thing for sure, and popular cinema when I grew up, they, they had their own style and stories, and the way they did it was completely different than any other countries. And uh, when right. now I look at what's released, it's it's those sort of they try to. First of all, the, their space got invaded by U.S. productions, and second, they try to, to mm -hmm. compete with that by copycatting it. And at the same time, they they lost what made them the unique uh, in the way. And now you look at things that they just like like um, what's the word? Uh, uh, oh, I got English, French, and German in my head right now. Uh, ersatz. Uh, they just add that of foreign of American movies rather than than being their their own thing. So it's difficult to en compete, engage, and uh, and have the confidence to do your own thing at the same time. It's uh you you're fighting on on three aspects at once. And it's it's also um, some of us designers do not want to end up becoming tokens. Meaning because we are Filipino POC, we will only make. Filipino games. Uh, I don't think that that I think that does a disservice to our kind of creativity, because I at least as a creator believe that your product is always going to be reflective of your culture, whether you know it or not. It is your culture that you are explaining, your worldview that you are communicating. You don't need to billboard "I am French" for it to be a French game, because if you are from France and you made a game, it's a French game. That's how it should be, right? If you are from the Philippines and you made a game, it's a Filipino game. Uh, we tend to be, at least on my end, very obsessed and also anxious over a sense of cultural identity. Uh, there are many factors to that, but uh, we also need to we need to avoid being tokenized abroad that we can only write a certain way. Like I noticed uh, when RPGC was beginning, many people were saying, oh, you guys only do weird little indie games. Like they were basically pigeonholing us into being only capable of writing story games, which was categorically untrue. Uh, RPGC comes from everywhere. I know designers who write on the DMs, uh, the DMs Guild for D&D, &D, and then I have my own side where I write for Blades in the Dark, and I write for other projects, and then I have friends who write for OSR, and then I have friends who write for story games, and then I have friends who write lyric games. It's There's no way to categorize it, so yeah. That's a, that's a problem that's I guess it's uh, in a way, I'm not sure it's all the brain function, but that's definitely all culture shaped us. That we always need to categorize things, to simplify things, to associate, to think, okay, Indian cinema, okay, so Bollywood, that's it. And it's yeah. people dancing, yeah, and, that's and that's it. China, it's Hong Kong productions, and, and we're missing the point that uh, those are huge countries, at least as big as any other. So they, they have yeah. a, a complete range of things rather than, uh, and they got popcorn thing as they have uh, things which are uh, very intellectually demanding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there uh, tabletop role-playing games, but uh, even other stuff that people listening to this could check out that you would recommend from, from entertainment, be it novels, maybe you mentioned Netflix, if there are other shows or movies which uh, you, you recommend uh, people check out and in the meantime I'm gonna google a name because I, I got a movie I'm not sure if it was uh, that I saw I'm not sure if it was for from the the Philippines uh, <laughs> that I, I I saw at the uh, genre cinema uh, uh, festival yeah I think we had a couple we tend to have an entry in Sundance and other festivals at least every year uh, from Filipino side but uh, in terms of I think for TV and movies, I am admittedly a bit behind, uh, mostly because I, I I dove headlong into tabletop RPG uh, the RPG scene. But I can recommend a lot of uh, RPG C games and a lot of Filipino games if people are interested. Um, like there is one called I think I mentioned Maharlika already, so that is an up and coming mech game that is a techno fantasy Philippines. Um, the system is elegant. It is literally. Uh, a D20 for a resolution, if I remember correctly, or was it a D10? It's it's one or the other. It's super simple. Uh, then there is also from the same author, Karandun. Uh, that is a K A R A N D 
U U N Karandoon. I'll ask uh, that you the, awesome. after this. I'll ask you for the link, and I, I will add you to. Uh, I will add sure. it to the the description. <laughs> no problem. Uh, it's also by Joaquin, and that is it. It is a as he decide as he described it. It is a fantastic analogy of the Philippines rebelling against colonial powers, but he does it through PTBA martial arts and a lot of dark and interesting things. So that is Karandoon. Um, then of course, there's my stuff. I'll never stop yelling about my stuff when it comes to games. Um, and there is an OSR supplement called Cockamania, which is about cockfighting. It was uh, written by my friend BJ, and it has a tinola recipe. So if you want to know what chicken soup is like in the Philippines, you can get it through Cockamania. Um, then I think Sword Queen, James, uh, Sword Queen uh, Games under Jammy, that all of their stuff is... Uh, everywhere on my side, but I want to tell more people about it, especially if they are unaware. Uh, they are a very prolific designer, currently suffering from some major health issues, but their design work is remarkable in the sense that it has inspired other designers to make their own things. So they are very big on story games, and they've done many works, one of them being Balikbayan, which is a cyberpunk Filipino fantasy. And uh, I have an I have a project from a friend named Bianca uh, Momentos on her Twitter. She is producing her own RPG system called ARC, A-R-C. It is a totally new system. She made it from ground up and it will be under Exalted Funeral. Um, I could honestly talk forever about all of the games. I'm only mentioning Filipino ones. Um, but more people, like if people follow me on Twitter, they will see me plugging these games regularly because both RPGC on my end and Sword Dream, the OSR space that I came from, we firmly believe in uplifting other people. So whenever there's a chance, I yell about all my friends' games. And when I see a game that uh, I, I know and I really, really like, I also try to plug that because it's important that more people notice them. Uh, my partner also writes really great games. Um, they may actually be known for their plant games where you play houseplants. Uh, they wrote, I think, maybe four supplements to that. So uh, our range is massive from large projects to tiny ones. Uh, we have a lot out there. So, so during the lockdown, uh, I ended up playing a lot of online game and I also came to realize something. I'm terrible. I'm lazy and terrible at reading games to run them. So what I need is <laughs> to play a game with someone running it for me and, and then I can run it myself and introduce more yeah. people to it. Uh, I was very happy to engage more with the Gauntlet recently, but I was wondering, are there online spaces, uh, opportunities uh, of joining games run by uh, people of, of RPGC to discover their game? Well, um, some of us have been trying to set up streams, uh, but our time zones make it very difficult for our American friends. I mean, to, so right to now we play as to... a player, not necessarily to, not just to watch, but... Uh... Oh, well, um, right now, nothing comes to mind. I think uh, we're all kind of working out our own quarantine schedules. So we have a hard time uh, opening up online spaces for play. Uh, I have noticed that a lot of people um, tend to have their own discords. So if you are signed up for their Patreon, you will get a chance at, at joining one of their games. That's kind of how I do it on my end, although I've been very remiss with scheduling. But generally, um, if you follow some of us on Twitter, sometimes we will post and say, hey, I need playtesters. You want to join? Like, I think it'll be very random. Um, but in terms of spaces, Asians represent might have a lot of uh, game postings. I am admin there. Uh, that's not necessarily RPGC. But if you want to connect with a lot of Asian creators, you kind of want to learn and listen. Um, we have very good community guidelines and we are trying to build a very productive space. So um, people are welcome to go there. I think right now the community is open. Uh, our RPGC community is by invite only, uh, but generally if somebody inside refers uh, you or others to the admin, 
uh, you will get in and people post their games there. So I think outside of personal Patreons, those are the two that are top of mind for kind of connecting and, and joining. Um, we also try to sign up for online cons uh, whenever they happen and host our own games. So I guess uh, that'd be it. Great. There's no RPG C con in the works per chance. Mm, we were trying to set one up. Uh, it wasn't really an RPG C con, but it was an indie con for Filipino design. Uh, it was called Session Zero. We had our first one last year. We had big plans for this one, and then the pandemic kind of threw everything into chaos. So we are looking to host it around 2021, if all goes well. So uh, we might have a Kickstarter in the works for that, and we plan on inviting international guests. And because it is an indie con for the Philippines, we will be inviting our friends from RPGC to fly in or to send their products so that we can show them off. It's a, it's an online convention I need so I can come play a lot of games uh, over one weekend. <laughs> if I find anything, I'll let you know. <laughs> Great. Uh, I found out the movie I was looking for. Sadly, it's. Uh, I apologize for confusing. Uh, it was a Thailand movie, not a, mm. not a Filipino mm. movie. Uh, but I do recommend to check 13 Beloved, apparently uh, called Game of Death. Uh, in English, uh, I think I'm going to try to cover it in uh, in film studies one day. It's uh, someone receive a text message telling them, "Oh, you're going to get ten bands, if uh, bands being the the local currency, if you do that little thing, if you catch that fly in your office, and then are oh, you going to get a a hundred if you put the the fly in your mouth?" and it goes on and on and on and the, the the challenges become crazier and crazier and the price also grows along it and uh, it's a it's a horror slash thriller movie so uh, i recommend to check it out <laughs> uh thank you so much for joining us pamu uh, is there anything else you wish to discuss uh before we we part ways oh uh, nothing nothing much just i guess if you were impressed and you want to support me uh, find me on Patreon. Otherwise, um, please check out my projects. Uh, tip me if you want to. I'm always around. and Invite me on your streams and hire me because I'm always open. Amazing. I will include a, a link uh, to your Patreon in the description of this. Uh, I'm reposting this on YouTube and then much later uh, on the podcast feed. So please go check out the, the link. Thanks to the people who join us in the in the chat room, we had Erwin who joined us. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is goodbye. Uh, I mean, you just said where people can find you. Uh, so yeah, bye everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. And thanks so much, Pamu, for introducing us to what's going on in Southeast Asia. <laughs> Cheers. See you.